What we get wrong about closing the racial wealth gap. Myth five, greater financial literacy will close the racial wealth gap. Hamilton and Darity have argued that all too often, the framing of the racial wealth gap focuses on poor financial choices and decisions on the part of blacks. Evidence put forth to make the case for black financial illiteracy includes blacks disproportionate use of alternative financial service products like payday loans, auto title loans, and check cashing institutions. These financial services have fees and interest payments that far exceed more conventional options. Other evidence put forth also includes racial variations in portfolio composition in which the blacks have a much larger share of their assets in the form of home equity. Here, blacks are characterized as making the suboptimal decision to invest in low return housing assets instead of higher yield financial assets. For many Americans with any significant level of wealth, home equity makes up a predominant amount of their assets. The consumption value of home ownership, including access to schools and other desirable neighborhood amenities, and the tax preferred status of owning a home should be considered when examining portfolio shares. Regardless of race, Historically, a home is the first major asset purchased by most Americans. The key point is whites generally have more resources to invest at the outset. Not only do they invest more in home ownership, they invest more in financial assets too. Basically, whites have more of every asset simply because they have more resources. Hamilton and Darity have observed that attributing the racial wealth gap to a more diverse asset portfolio for whites is ambiguous at best given that it is wealth in the first place that is associated with having a more diverse asset portfolio. The problem with assigning differences in cost of finance and asset portfolios to difference in financial acumen is its directional emphasis. Meager economic circumstances, not poor decision making or deficient knowledge, constrain choices and leave asset poor borrowers with little to no other option but to use predatory and abusive alternative financial services. A negligible level of economic resources readily explains why blacks, specifically, use more predatory financial institutions. Indeed, Jonathan Morduck and Rachel Schneider's U.S. Financial Diaries project reveals that the use of predatory financial products and alternative financial services are often last resort finance options for economically fragile borrowers after all other options, including borrowing from family and friends have been exhausted. As we have noted, wealth begets more wealth. Higher levels of wealth enable greater access to more favorable terms for credit. Wealth provides individuals and families with financial agency and choice. It provides economic security to take risks and shields against the risk of economic loss. Basically, wealth is cumulative. It provides people with the necessary capital to secure finance and purchase an appreciating asset, which in turn would generate more and more wealth. Literally, it takes wealth to make wealth. While blacks largely have been excluded from the intergenerational access to capital and finance, it merits noting, again, that the Gittleman and Wolf study cited in the previous section, which used panel data long prior to the 2007 predatory subprime mortgage lending crisis, did not find a significant racial difference in asset appreciation rates for households with positive assets once household income is taken into account. This result emerged despite the well-documented evidence of historical and ongoing housing and lending discrimination. There is also a presumption that, as a result of financial irresponsibility, blacks carry much greater debt than whites, but this presumption is not valid. Tippett and co-authors find that, overall, a slightly larger share of white families has unsecured debt than black families. Furthermore, after controlling for basic socioeconomic and demographic characteristics, the study finds no significant difference in the value of black and white family unsecured debt holdings. When unsecured debt is disaggregated into three categories, one, store bills and credit card debt, two, loans from a bank or credit union, and three, other types of debts, including student loans and medical bills, it is only the other category in which there is a statistically significant racial difference in unsecured debt, 21.5% for black families and 19% for white families. This debt category represents borrowing for school and other critical needs, including medical care.
Paul et al. demonstrates that among relatively better off students who are able to attend college, blacks are 25% more likely to accumulate student debt and, on average, borrow 10% more than their white counterparts. The adverse implications of the liability produced by these racial differences and self-investment debt are compounded by the fact that black students are one-third less likely to complete their degrees, often because of the greater financial burden that precipitated student loan borrowing in the first place. Paul et al. found that 29% of black students who leave college after their first year do so for financial reasons. Student loan debt and mortgage debt traditionally have provided Americans with access to the finance needed to purchase an appreciating asset such as a house or secure a job in the professional or managerial sector. In effect, mortgage debt and student loan debt may be considered a form of good debt, especially in comparison to other types of debt like credit card debt, which is often associated with consumption or some good that rapidly depreciates in value. However, the implication of so-called good debt has different meaning once we consider race in the prevailing framework of subjecting a marginalized racial group to inferior housing and educational projects, predatory finance, and labor market discrimination. Also relevant is the intensifying context of economic precarity and income volatility in U.S. labor markets, where Americans, and blacks in particular, increasingly have less control of when and for how long they work. This makes access to short-term credit, including credit card debt, an essential element in management of household budgets, particularly for vulnerable households without the financial cushion of liquid assets. Pressure to utilize credit cards to balance household budgets in the midst of expense and income volatility continues despite substantial reported disdain for their use. See evidence from a consumer attitude survey published by the Pew Charitable Trust 2015. As stated above, it is ultimately racial differences in initial endowments of and access to financial resources that sustain and fuel the racial wealth gap. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, white families tend to have greater access to mortgages and credit than black and Latino families. Even when black and Latino homeowners are able to secure mortgages, they experience higher rates of foreclosure and housing distress than white families, in part because they are systematically offered riskier loans this obviously has implications with regards to myth two, that the racial home ownership gap is the driver of the racial wealth gap as well. Furthermore, home equity for black American homeowners has not increased at the same rate as it has for white homeowners, largely because home values in the neighborhoods to which blacks have been systematically restricted have been slow to recover since the housing crisis. Consequently, they have also generated lower returns on mortgage debt. Other research suggests that inheritances and other intergenerational wealth transfers often benefit white families more than black families. Greater financial literacy can be valuable if an individual or household has finances to manage. Financial literacy without finance is meaningless. There is no magical way to transform no wealth into great wealth simply by learning more about how to manage one's monetary resources. While wealth begets wealth, typically, no wealth begets no wealth, regardless of how astute a money manager the person may be.